It really gives me great pleasure this morning to uh, welcome our, our newest center, and that is uh, the um, Royal Surrey County Hospital in Guildford, Surrey, England, uh, which houses the MATU, which is the Min Minimal Access uh, Therapy Training Unit. Um, Mr. Michael Bailey uh, is the founder of the MATU and uh, has been the lead consultant uh, surgeon there for many years. Uh, Mr. Bailey is uh, truly one of the uh, uh, pioneers in minimally invasive surgery in Britain, and I'm going to uh, welcome uh, Michael, and uh, Michael will then introduce um, uh, Mr. Sean Preston uh, uh, to uh, start off the discussion today. Welcome, Michael. Well, good morning, Adrian. It's a great pleasure and privilege for us to be uh, joined uh, in this uh, very exciting project which uh, you and your colleagues have uh, instituted. As you say, we're at the Minimal Access Therapy Training Unit Batch here part of the University of Surrey uh, and the Royal Surrey County Hospital. We're about 25 miles south of London to give you an idea of our geographical location. We run many, many courses each year, over 60, in a variety of different specialties. Uh, we are the regional centre for sophiogastric cancer, for pancreatic cancer and for liver uh, cancer and resections. Um, I won't go into too much detail at the moment, but Mr. Preston will be uh, telling you this as part, of his, uh, as part of his talk. So um, what I'm going to do now is to hand over to Sean Preston, who is the lead uh, consultant for gastric cancer, and he will uh, give you an idea of what we do here, uh, aspects of the surgery, and also say something about the enhanced recovery programs, which we try to do in all, all the uh, liver specialties. So I'll hand you over to him now. Thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you, Adrian, for uh, giving us this great opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, for those uh, listening in, um, we had discussions prior to this about the broader aspects of minimal access esophageal and gastric surgery, and consider this too vast, and therefore we'll concentrate on esophageal surgery. I'll try to put minimally invasive surgery in the context of improving outcomes for this awful disease. I will deliberately avoid chemotherapy and chemoradiotherapy um, and concentrate on what we can do as surgeons. First, a little bit of background. In the 1990s within the UK, there was a cancer action plan initiated by the NHS executive and supported by government with the aim of improving outcomes for cancer across the country. In 2001, this document, uh, Improving Outcomes for Upper GI Cancer, recommended that units that were to provide surgery for esophageal and gastric cancer must serve a population of at least 1 million, and those with pancreatic cancer, a population of at least 2 million. After much bloodshed, there are now eventually 40 esophageal gastric units serving a population of 64 million, with an average population of 1.5 per unit. This is the uh, esophagogastric unit here at the Royal Surrey County Hospital for Matthew. As uh, Professor Bailey's already stated, we are uh, southwest of London. Uh, we have a catchment area of 1.5 million people, which, re which results in a referral base of 350 new cases per annum, and we perform 90 receptions per annum. We're also a quaternary referral centre for Boerhaves and for complex benign esophagogastric surgery. As with many cancer institutes in the uh, US and around the world, all cases are discussed in a weekly esophagogastric uh, multidisciplinary team meeting. Not only the resection cases, but those going to radical uh, non-surgical therapy and all palliative cases. The meeting also links in with all referring hospitals. Um, as, as Professor Bailey's already stated, we are a tertiary referral centre uh, for many cancers. Um, mainly the gastrointestinal and urogynological tract. We also have the uh, best outcomes in the UK for uh, colorectal cancer resection. We have a dedicated oncology centre and, as Professor Beer stated, the laparoscopic training unit, which is the largest in the UK. So, on to the main context of the uh, main text of the uh, lecture. So, esophageal cancer. What is so special about this disease? Historically, it had an appalling. Uh, Outlook with 30%, uh, with one third 30 day mortality, and of those, uh, the survival at one year was only 29%. We made steady inroads, 
with remarkable reduction in mortality and steady improvements in survival, such that dedicated centres are now uh, achieving uh, extremely low morbidity and mortality. Despite these improvements in uh, morbidity and mortality, uh, despite the improvements in morbidity, um, it remains, still remains an extremely morbid um, procedure with uh, complications documented in over 50% of uh, patients on average. In those with speciality, there are on average uh, 3.2 major complications associated with the mortality and the predominant factor um, is of pulmonary complications, but these are occurring in 67%. The, uh, we, we previously looked at uh, factors associated with mortality in the unit that I worked on in the north of England um, and found that whilst pulmonary complications were a major factor, those affecting the gastrointestinal tract were associated with very high associated mortality. One of the great problems in, uh, in, in looking at outcomes, and especially morbidity associated with esophagectomy, is the great variety with which it is uh, reported. In this paper in the Annals of Surgery, the, the, the outcome reported was, the outcome reporting for esophageal cancer surgery was described as inconsistent and lacking methodological rigor. We really must do better. But why am I, why am I talking about complications? Why are they important? This is, a, is an extremely interesting study um, from the VA by Curie, published in the Adult Surgery 2005, and it looked at 106,000 patients undergoing eight commonly performed procedures, uh, most of which are non-oncological, uh, with a median of eight-year follow-up. And what they found was that in those patients who experienced a complication within 30 days of surgery, there was a 69% reduction in overall survival. Excluding those that died within 30 days, the reduction in survival was uh, still, main in long term, was maintained. Looking at the two most common complications, wound infection and pulmonary complications, you can see the dramatic effect that the pulmonary complication has on long term survival for benign disease. And they concluded that the single most important predictor of long-term survival was not the preoperative risk, but whether there was a major complication within 30 days of the procedure. This effect has previously been demonstrated uh, uh, by Morris Sloan Kettering in esophageal cancer. It has not, however, been reported in every uh, study. We've already seen some data from Don Lowe's group earlier on, and when they reported this, they saw no effect. However, looking at the, at the uh, complication profile, the predominant complications were of, uh, of atrial flutter and fibrillation and of delirium, neither of which were included in the Curie study and neither of which are of, 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 of particularly septic complications which appear to have a predominant effect. Complications are also extremely costly. You can see that from these graphs that the effect of a complication increases the cost of delivery of the procedure by between ten and thirty thousand dollars per case. It also increases bed utilization by between three and ten days on, on average. The severity of the complications when assessed by a hoarding grade also uh, correlate well with the uh, cost and length of stay um, apart from according to rates of mortality. So what can we do about this? There's been a number of excellent publications by John Bergmeier over the years. And the, the, the overwhelming uh, message from this is that we need to remove the occasional esophagectomies. Those that perform low volumes of cases in low volume centers have unacceptably high mortality overall. And you can see on both graphs with the concentration of relatively low numbers of individual and, vol and hospital volume that mortality can be reduced significantly. Over six cases per year and over 19 cases per institution are regarded as low volume uh, in many centres 
And does this effect continue? This study from uh, Jan van Landschot uh, in the Dutch National Registry has demonstrated that increasing the volume of consent to higher to over 50 cases per year produces a further reduction in mortality. Within the UK, over the last eight years, we've uh, been very lucky to have a national audit programme which produces almost annual uh, reports on factors affecting esophagogastric cancer. Using this data, we've been able to assess the impact of the centralisation process. Even the top graph that there are now, uh, that up to 2008, there was a dramatic reduction in those numbers of centres performing less than 10 cases per annum. And now there are almost no centres performing any esophageal surgery only an occasional gastrectomy done out of the dedicated centre, with most centres now performing way in excess of 20 cases per year, with the majority performing between 50 and 100, and exceptional centres performing up to 170 cases per annum. The effect of this has been a steady reduction in the mortality associated with both esophagectomy and gastrectomy across the UK. Within the US, there is not uh, unless uh, the president gets his way, a, a socialised healthcare system, and therefore the drivers of, uh, of, of change differ. We have a centralised service where we're directed by the NHS and by the government. However, within the, within the uh, US, there are clearly other driving forces. This independent group uh, reports on um, outcomes and uh, cost effectiveness of therapy, and are used by many of the insurers to direct surgery. Also, the uh, VA National Surgery Quality Improvement Programs and other such things highlight areas of, uh, of excellence and also those of concern. And there is undoubtedly an effect on outcome uh, from these measures. You can see from the uh, bottom right table that there are a gradual reduction in the number of centres performing esophageal reduction surgery and a gradual increase in the uh, hospital volume, but still at exceptionally low levels. There is, however, a steady reduction. This has, however, is correlated with a steady reduction in risk associated mortality associated with esophagectomy. And they report that they, that they, they calculated that 30% of the reduction in mortality was explained by the increase in hospital volume. So, I give a chance to ask for some questions. Thank you. Um, thank you. Sean, um, let's go to our colleagues at the Cleveland uh, Clinic Weston. Um, we've uh, heard some very interesting data already, and um, Sam or uh, Manny, the question I'd like to put out is, um, uh, what is what is uh, special about uh, surgery for esophageal cancer? Remember, you've got. Remember that you have surgeons um, in the audience who do bariatric and colorectal and hernia surgery who think their procedures are important. So can we still rationalize the occasional esophagectomist as, um, as Sean suggested? Thank you so much for the question and thank you for uh, the presentation for our British colleagues. Um, I think it's an excellent point. Uh, uh, among the uh, uh, minimally advanced techniques in several uh, other fields, uh, uh, the one for esophageal surgery is the one that has been uh, only very recently been uh, applied here at the Cleveland Clinic in Florida. Uh, historically, up until one year ago, uh, pretty much 100% of the esophagectomies were performed uh, with a, um, uh, an open approach. Uh, uh, usually transiatal with an uh, anastomosis in the neck. And uh, following some of the, uh, the data and the more recent data in the last year, we've been uh, very slowly, I have to say, moving towards a minimal invasive approach uh, with uh, 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 transabdominal laparoscopy and then again uh, an incision in the neck and uh, anastomosis in the neck. So is it justified? Uh, um, well, I don't think we know that answer yet. So the reality is at least the uh, patient population that we tend to see here uh, tends to be older with a lot of comorbidities, a lot of uh, pulmonary complications and comorbidities. Uh, 
and relatively more advanced disease and that's been historically the issue of uh, trying to apply these minimum invasive techniques at least in our patient population. So um, I, I think there's a role for it uh, but the patient selection will be uh, uh, the hardest thing to figure out. Thanks, uh, thanks Manny, appreciate your comments. Um, I'd like to, we're going to be talking, and Sean's going to be talking about technique in, in, in a few minutes. Um, I'd like to go up to our colleagues at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and uh, we had a presentation from them within the last year on, on minimally invasive techniques for, for gut cancers. Um, and let me pose the same question uh, somewhat provocatively. Can we tolerate the occasional, still, can we tolerate the occasional esophagectomy? That's a terrific question, and as you very nicely in the presentation mentioned, there are certainly barriers to centralization in the U.S. It's a different system, but the data overwhelmingly supports centralization of these procedures. Uh, the mechanism by which that's going to occur is certainly uh, difficult here in the U.S., but I think more and more of these operations, especially if they are becoming more complex with the introduction of minimally invasive techniques, potentially robotic procedures, as we've been applying here, there certainly is an impetus towards centralization and putting these operations in the hands of more experienced surgeons. Yes. All right. Thank you, Sean. Let me uh, let me hand back to you at this point. So, as we mentioned, we'll now move on to minimally invasive esophagectomy. Yeah, this is a term applied that applies to a variety of procedures, some of which are hybrid, combining laparoscopic or thoracoscopic surgery with an open approach and some are entirely minimally invasive. The potential advantages of this surgery are reduction in blood loss, reduced morbidity, reduced respiratory complications, less pain, short hospital stay, and earlier functional recovery as we've seen in many other uh, applications of minimum access surgery. It is, however, important to remember that these are complex procedures, they are oncological procedures, and we must maintain the principles and standards of resection and reconstruction, irrespective of the approach used. There is no doubt that with a minimally access, minimal access approach, we can reduce the external trauma of the procedure. These, both, both of these patients have the same procedure performed by the same surgeon, myself, by different approaches. The view within the chest is uh, fantastic with the patient's prone, with the lung, some would use single lung, some would use dual lung ventilation, and it is possible to perform the same level of radicality of uh, lymph node dissection by both laparoscopic and open approaches. Most, because of the difficulty in performing anastomosis from the chest, we adopt the three-phase minimally invasive approach with a laparoscopic gastric mobilization, Lymph node dissection, as varies in level of radicality around the world. Formation of a gastric conduit that may be performed intra or extracorporeally. And then posterior mediastinal passage of the tube with a cervical reconstruction. This is, before, this is a video of our thoracoscopic dissection. So with a patient prone, and the, with the single lung ventilation, uh, we have an excellent view of the spine azagus and aorta on the superior aspect. There you can see the thoracic duct. The azagus arch is excised. And dissection uh, extends onto the uh, surface of the aorta, resecting the thoracic duct and spinning the on block. We then uh, divide the azagus uh, vein again close to the STC to improve access and then extend our anterior section dividing the pleura which allows visualization of the uh, posterior aspect of the rotis. We use bipolar scissors for this part of the dissection as there are many reports of increased incidence of uh, uh, bronchial injury from the use of the uh, 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 um, energy sources near, near the airways. This is a dissection across the back of the uh, inferior pulmonary vein. Thoracic duct then ligated. 
the section extending across to the uh, left pleura. The esophagus is mobilized, slung, you can see a back across the back of the heart with all the tissue resected on block. And then we concentrate finally on resection of the uh, right left bronchial and subrenal lymph node package. Following completion of the uh, uh, thoracoscopic dissection, the esophagus is mobilized from the hiatus, however not extending this section through into the abdomen in order to maintain the uh, pneumoperitoneum. Okay. There are, however, challenges to the provision of minimal access surgery, both here and I'm sure in the US. One of the greatest challenges is of the see, And it is important that we are able to uh, visualize the, uh, the, the arcade and maintain a healthy stomach with a stiff liver and a great size of momentum. This can, prove, this can prove extremely challenging and also affect the ability to perform the lymph node deception. And as I stated earlier, it's important to maintain the principles. As I mentioned earlier, many people do a three phase reconstruction. Um, uh, uh, then minimal access surgery, but with standard with a distal esophageal and a junctional carcinoma, perform a two phase reconstruction of open surgery. It is uh, well reported that the two phase approach can be performed laparoscopically both with circular staplers, linear staplers, and hand stone, but it is a greater technical challenge. Now, it's impossible to talk about minimally invasive esophagectomy without mentioning this chap. This is Jim Lukatic from UPMC in Pittsburgh. And they reported in 2012 the largest series of 1,000 patients uh, who underwent minimally invasive surgery. There was a comment earlier that they were starting with minimal access uh, uh, gastric mobilization for transpiatal surgery. That's where Jim started. And then they moved on to a three phase approach. And then when I was there in uh, 2006, they just reported their first 50 Ivor Lewis type two phase minimal access subject to me. Uh, to the Southern Thoracic Society. They were doing five or six a week when I was there and they continued at that rate, if not greater, such that they've now performed over 500 of these cases. They can do so, um, but they found that by moving from a three to a two phase subjectomy, they reduced their incidence of vocal cord paralysis, and also there is a trend towards a reduction in mortality associated with this. Their, survive, their state specific survival for these minimal access uh, approaches are appropriate and their adequacy of cancer resection comparable amongst the groups of an extremely high standard. They are not the most radical in terms of lymph node dissection but they perform a good lymphadenectomy which can be seen in the lymph node uh, yields on the bottom of, this, of the table. The, there is great interest in minimally invasive esophagectomy, as can be seen by the graph with the increased incidence of the use of the minimal access approaches to esophagectomy in the UK, and also the increased incidence of publication associated with the uh, topic. Is it any better? This is a meta-analysis of comparative studies performed uh, by the unit um, at University College London. And they looked at uh, a number of studies and compared totally minimally invasive approach to an open esophagectomy. And they found a reduction loss, ITU stay, length of overall stay, and of respiratory complications. But there was also a reduction in total morbidity, and the number of lymph nodes affected per case was unchanged. When they compared, when they compared hybrid approaches to uh, open esophagectomy, they found a reduction in blood loss, reducing leak rate, a reduction in respiratory, it didn't find a reduction in overall morbidity, and once again, it was the lymph node section. There is one published minimally and uh, randomized comparative trial, the time trial, uh, yeah, Dutch trial, but also with input from uh, units in the town. The units contributing formed at least 30 units per year, and were, the cases were randomized to a minimal access approach or an open resection 
Two thirds of patients in both groups had a survival anastomosis, and minimal access approaches were performed. Primarily. The primary endpoint was respiratory complications within two weeks. And what they found was that in the minimal access group, there was a significant reduction in respiratory complications. They also found some improvements in early quality of life measures. The lymph node dissection was comparable. The uh, overall mortality was, was comparable. And with many uh, studies, they found similar findings of uh, an increased operative time associated with minimal access approach, but with a reduced blood loss. One unusual finding within this study was the high incidence of vocal cord paralysis within the open group, which in itself would relate would correlate with a higher incidence of respiratory complications. This is not discussed in the paper. Um, Christoph Mariette's unit in uh, Lille looked at uh, hybrid minimally invasive esophagectomy in a comparative case with an institution, and they found that a hybrid approach was an independent predictor of the, uh, in terms of reduction in uh, reduction of more uh, of major pulmonary complications. And this led to them uh, constructing and now running a uh, randomised controlled trial of hybrid esophagectomy versus open esophagectomy, the MIRO trial, which is currently underway. Within the UK, we also have a currently running randomised controlled trial, a Romeo trial, comparing, uh, run by Professor Jane Blaisby, comparing open esophagectomy with hybrid, with minimally invasive surgery. Clearly, we'll get interesting information moving forward from these two trials. There are also, as somebody alluded to, I think a memorial uh, uh, of, of advancing technology. This is our, this is our first uh, 3D minimally invasive esophagectomy performed on the 12th of May 2011. And as somebody alluded to, there may potentially be further benefits from the use of the robot, which we're not currently adopting. Thank you. Uh, any further questions at that point, Adrian? Yes, thanks, John. Let's uh, pause for a couple of comments and uh, um, again I'll just invite our uh, audience and participants if uh, you have any questions or comments to call them in. Um, but actually I want to go to our own thoracic surgeons here at, uh, at the Anne Arundel Medical Center with Dr. Steve Gutanio and Ava Manishian. Just comments here, not just your own practice but where you see things moving in terms of minimally invasive esophagectomy. Um, uh, Abo, you're one of the uh, uh, kind of early leaders in uh, computer-assisted esophagectomy. Just wh where do you see this going? The are we at the two phase, the three phase? Uh... Well, I, I, if I can, I actually have a question that I'd, I'd like to pose. Uh, in, in trying to develop a minimally invasive approach for, for centers that conventionally do decent volume to high volume but open surgery, um, a couple of thoughts that I have or, or, or questions for you would be. Uh, what would be your recommendations, one, for how you deal with the learning curve of a, of a minimal invasive esophagectomy? What, what would you propose we do uh, if we're conventional open surgeons uh, in terms of the esophageal approach for minimizing risk to patients as we learn to do a minimal invasive esophagectomy? And secondly, patient selection, I think, is a big deal in this scenario. Uh, and I, I'd be curious to know what to factors such as operative time uh, have to do with outcomes because short of a randomized controlled trial if you're selecting young healthy patients that can be in the operating room for seven eight hours if that's how long it's taken to do a minimal invasive approach uh, that's a very different animal than taking a 65 year old with multiple mo comorbidities do you lose some of the advantages of the uh, MIE approach if you're doing those more more elderly and uh, sicker patients uh, keeping them in the OR for for long periods of time what, what would that uh, result in, do you think? Uh, is that directed to me, Adrian? Yeah, yeah, John, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, there's, a, there's a whole bag of, uh, of interesting facts there. And, and I think that the, 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 the learning curve aspect is clearly a difficult one. The, I think the thoracoscopic dissection is extremely easy. And I think if you're going to introduce this, then a thoracoscopic dissection for the nose is, is the safest way of, of doing that in, uh, initially. Certainly the, uh, the Brisbane group, they do a thoracoscopic dissection and an open abdomen and they see that with the neck anastomosis and they find that what works best for them. When they then move to a completely minimally invasive approach, 
the profile went up. Most units, when they're starting, would use some form of hybrid procedure, either concentrate on the abdomen, concentrate on the chest, and then combine them. I don't think to go from standard practice to a completely minimally invasive esophagectomy in one move is the best way forward. I think it sh should be done in a staged, uh, staged manner. The, the, the question uh, or the comment raised about the elderly patients is a really, really interesting one. What we find with, with those patients is that a minimal approach in an elderly patient is most, is, is most troublesome for the abdominal phase. If you're somebody who performs a, uh, a limited nodal dissection with just a stapling on the left gastric, don't perform a pyroplasty, don't put a chupating jejunostomy in and are just staying there essentially to, mo to tubularize the, esophagus, the, the stomach and mobilize it, then fine, no problem, it's an easy thing to do. If you're aiming to do a radical dissection with all of the add-ons, it takes time. And in an elderly patient with a positive pressure within the abdomen, steep head up position, it does have its effects. And our, our anesthetists call it minimal access, maximal physiological stress. And it, it does undoubtedly affect the patients um, if you are um, performing the, the more radical uh, extent of the uh, uh, of the spectrum of, uh, of resection, because one man's esophagectomy is not another man's esophagectomy. The level of radicality and the add-ons to the procedure vary enormously. So the, we, we could discuss this ad, ad nauseam, but I think a staged introduction and be careful with the very obese and those that, uh, more elderly patients should be avoided. All very uh, tumours. We had a meeting in the UK. Uh, 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 several years ago now looking at, at, at appropriateness and, um, uh, and case selection for minimal access surgery and it was felt that those tumours of the mid to distal esophagus that weren't too bulky, avoiding obese patients and avoiding extremes of age were, uh, were, were the way to go forward. Thanks, John. Why, why don't you uh, continue now um, with the next section? Thank you. Okay. So thus far we've uh, suggested that uh, we may improve outcomes by uh, concentrating services in specialist centres, by adapt uh, possibly adopting a uh, minimal access approach, but this is something else that we've been working on, uh, looking at enhanced recovery and standardised pathways, and uh, talking to you yesterday, you know, I believe this was a, a hot topic at, uh, at SAGES. All right. Can we go to our, uh, our we're, can we go to our colleagues at Dalhousie? I want to just um, I want to uh, hear from Dalhousie um, uh, the approach uh, that is taken up there in terms of minimally invasive esophagectomy and how if you're doing it how have you graduated into into that? So um, the it's an interesting question and I was sitting here with uh, 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 Dr. Jack Antonio who is the uh, the head of uh, yeah, Cancer yeah, Care Nova Scotia and yeah, primary yeah. clinical practice is more of gastric cancer. We don't have any of our uh, our thoracic surgeons here right now who would uh, obviously give you a better uh, comment on the uh, our soft geal experience. Um, you know, our catchment area is basically about a million people and, and uh, we're doing somewhere on the order of uh, 70 cases a year of combined esophagectomy and gastrectomy as far as the, the numbers go. So the um, the there was a, uh, at one point, we were looking at moving towards a, a, a total conversion to uh, laparoscopic esophagectomy. We did some initial uh, experience with it. The, the, the thoracic surgery team wasn't particularly uh, happy with the learning curve and they essentially reverted uh, back to uh, basically open esophagectomy. There are members of the team that currently do a uh, kind of a hybrid where they do uh, the, the, the chest approach in an MIS of fashion and then convert to a more traditional uh, two hole uh, thereafter. So it's, it's interesting that we've, we've, in a sense, we've sputtered uh, as far as an adoption of the MIS esophagectomy. Um, and, uh, and I like the question that was raised about, you know, how, you know, how, how do you approach that? Uh, because uh, certainly our experience has been that we've kind of approached it and then actually stepped step back uh, and there's a, there's, a, there's a number of variables uh, uh, that go along with that. And one of the ones that came up in the, in the conversation here was that uh, 
in an academic teaching center, uh, you take an operation which uh, uh, open softectomy was something that the, the learners, the, the residents played an active role in, and then you, you take it to an MIS esophagectomy, and that becomes an operation that the learners actually have a very little role in. And that was certainly, when I was involved in that experience, that was something that I, I saw that was certainly a downside that we don't talk about too much uh, when we focus purely on the oncological outcomes. And, and so, it's a, it's a, again, it's an interesting consideration. Um, most of our advances as far as soft geal cancer, interestingly enough, have been more on the endoscopic side and how we approach the early neoplasia. And that's also had a big impact on just our overall approach, but the, uh, you know, with EMR and ESD and that sort of stuff. But as far as the, uh, the esophagectomy goes, we're kind of, uh, at present, uh, you know, using a, 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 a conservative open approach. Thanks, Jim, and I, I suspect that your experience is not uncommon uh, around uh, around the country. Um, <coughs> let's return now to uh, to uh, Surrey and uh, Sean. I think we have you back online. Uh, one area in which we've uh, found that one, one which has been highlighted that there's been no reduction in the uh, overall length of stay. So esophagectomy, the orange line, gastrectomy. The pink and pancreatic resection in the blue line. There's also considerable variability within regions for the for of length of stay for the same procedures. Before 2007, there were very few publications of uh, enhanced recovery or standard pathway to esophagectomy. However, the more recent years, there's been a big flurry of publications as people appreciate that it is applicable to esophageal resection. I became interested in this in 2007 when Don Lowe presented his uh, first paper. We've been trying for years to mobilize patients, read the paper, we still couldn't do it. So 2009 he came here to present, um, we tried to implement it, couldn't do it. We just could not get patients out of bed. So eventually I took a team to uh, Virginia Mason in Seattle and within a month of uh, returning, having seen that, that getting the staff to believe that it was possible to uh, mobilize patients after esophagectomy, we were suddenly able, with a few simple steps, to improve our uh, patient mobilization, starting on the first post-operative day. Um, Alison, could you run the second video, please? Yeah, you got any pain? None. All right, take a big breath in, big as you can. And out. And in. All right, good. Just so Mr. This gentleman had his esophagectomy uh, yesterday. It's now 8 a.m. Uh, and he's been up since 7 a.m. Hi. How are you feeling? Very well, thank you. Yeah. Much comfortable. Than I imagined it would be. All right. Are you comfortable? I'm very comfortable. Yeah. Um, could be more comfortable. Right. Yeah. Can you take a big breath for me? And that's okay, it doesn't hurt? No. No, you don't feel lightheaded? No. No? And you're ready for your walk? Whatever, yes. <laughs> All right, well, great. Um, everybody tells me it's so terrible, so I'm yeah. sort of bracing myself. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you'll be fine. Okay. Just Mr. Hunter. So, patient's on. We stop day two. Mobilising. How do you feel? Um, not too bad. Yeah. Let's go. So uh, this gentleman's leaving. Post subject to me. Day eight. Day eight. Yeah. Hi. We looked at the implementation of the enhanced recovery pathway and found that overall uh, there was a reduction of four days length of stay. I, I, I performed approximately half of the cases and the pathway was implemented rigidly and this just resulted in a six day reduction in the median length of stay. My colleagues uh, didn't implement the whole pathway but the, their patients were mobilized. Um, uh, on the, from the first post of day, and this resulted in a three-day uh, reduction in median length of stay. There was a significant reduction in the use of uh, ventilated critical care beds, a slight increase in the uh, use of non-ventilated critical care beds, and a reduction in the uh, use of level one care. 
We did a crude cost analysis which showed initially we, uh, this resulted in an approximately £2,000 a year increase uh, because of staffing and uh, uh, bedded, but ultimately there was a £5,000 equating to an $8,500 per patient saving with the implementation of an enhanced recovery programme. You can only implement this if you empower patients and their families and uh, it's important that they're involved and they understand what they're going to do from the outset. The other uh, thing that's important is if patients do get a complication and they will, is to continue their uh, mobilization as once they've recovered from their single lung hit, single uh, injury hit, that they'll recover and be discharged much quicker. This is a very brief video, Alison. This is a gentleman who had an esophagectomy, who had, a, who had respiratory failure, required reintubation with a uh, tracheostomy, who continued to mobilise on ventilator uh, until he was suitable for weaning, and then was discharged home three days after his tracheostomy was, uh, was removed. Specialist centres can report an impressive series with low mobility and comparable outcomes, irrespective of the approach used for esophagectomy. Outcomes collected from population-based data are much more varied with higher rates of morbidity and mortality than those seen in specialist centres. St centralisation and standardised care, care pathways excuse me, are applicable to all approaches irrespective of, uh, of, uh, irrespective of the approach used for esophagectomy. Implementation will lead to uh, improved outcomes, reduced costs, um, incurred in delivering this service. Minimal access surgery is potential to improve outcomes further by reducing blood loss and pulmonary complications, but more data are required. So to conclude, septic complications have an adverse effect on survival. Complications are poorly defined, very widely in incidence for the same procedure and are poorly reported. We must improve this progress. Minimal access surgery may reduce blood loss and respiratory complications, but the road of minimal access surgery is still to be uh, uh, determined, and the results of the Romeo and Myro trials are awaited with interest. Reducing septic complications after esophagectomy will improve survival, will likely improve survival by an equivalent amount to that gained by neoadjuvant chemo or chemoradiotherapy. Whether the two effects combined may further improve uh, survival remains to be seen. Reducing complications will also reduce the cost of delivery of this expensive treatment. I'd like to thank all the members of my team who have been involved in this uh, process and also Don Lowe and Jim Lukatic for letting me uh, visit their units uh, which have helped my practice back here in the UK and also to them both for supporting our educational programme back in the UK and thank you all for listening. Thank you very Thank much, Sean. I think we just had a uh, uh, final uh, comment uh, from uh, Stephen Catanio, uh, the Chief of Thoracic Surgery here. Uh, thank you all for a very interesting presentation. Uh, similar to the Dalhousie experience, you know, while we have some experience with minimally invasive, we're now back to more of a conservative, uh, open approach. But I, I'm glad to hear that there's been more focus, or there is more focus now on the enhanced recovery as we really feel that's a key part of this. The surgical approach clearly has effect and importance with the perioperative recovery, but the, um, the pathways and the, the focus on early mobilization we feel is just as critical for the uh, ultimate outcomes. We've had excellent success uh, putting in thoracic epidurals, for example, that has really limited our pulmonary complications to where I don't think there's any, uh, in our experience anyway, significant difference with minimally invasive as compared to a mini thoracotomy for the esophageal mobilization. Um, thanks for those comments. And I think I just, uh, as we, we wrap up now, I want to I want to thank you, uh, Sean, for a, a very comprehensive um, uh, dealing with a very full and, and complex subject. Uh, I want to thank as well uh, uh, Mike Bailey for uh, 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 making the MATU uh, available for this uh, presentation. Um, so, so thank you both very much and we look forward to your participation uh, in future programs.